Hello everyone and welcome to the Resilient Sessions and I'm delighted to welcome Vic Hope and Sean Stocker. Thank you. Hello. How are you both today? Very well. I'm yeah. good, I'm yeah. looking forward to this. Me too. Brilliant. It's going to be fun. Good, well thank you for coming, um, so let's get started. So I thought it'd be a nice place to start if you both introduced each other. So Vic, would you go first, yes. please? Thank you. Age 16, Sean joined the 1st Battalion Royal Welsh Fusiliers as an infantry soldier in the British Army. Three years later, age 19, his life changed forever. Just six days from ending a tour of Afghanistan, Sean stepped on an IED. He lost both his legs above the knee, his left eye, the vision in his right eye, and suffered various other injuries. After spending two months in an induced coma and having over 40 operations, Sean started his journey of rehabilitation at Headley Court. Here, Sean began learning to walk on prosthetics and had an operation which gave him back 30% vision in his right eye. Sean now runs a successful property business, but his passion is charity work. He works with and raises money for multiple charities and is an accomplished inspirational speaker for secondary school students. Alongside this, Sean is working on a project with HMP Berwyn, putting together a programme to assist with the rehabilitation of the men in the veterans wing of the prison. Sean's input here has been so valuable that a wing of the prison has been named after him. Sean's dedication to helping others led to him being part of the Queen's 2019 New Year's Honour List receiving a British Empire medal. Thank you so much. Um, and now, Sean, are you ready to introduce Vic um, to us, please? This is Vic Hope, a Nigerian Geordie with a Cambridge degree. Vic is a multilingual and multi-skilled and multifaceted individual, making waves in the world of broadcast. At the age of 19, Vic spent a year living in Buenos Aires. As she joined the Argentina Independent as the youngest ever journalist. It was here where she was snapped up by MTV, beginning her career on entertainment shows on their international channels. Vic can now be found presenting a host of different shows on television and radio, including London's biggest breakfast show, Capital FM, with Roman Kemp every morning. She was a contestant on last year's Strictly Come Dancing, and this year she hosted the popular reality TV show Chipwrecked on E4. Alongside all her media work, Vic is a tireless human rights activist and campaigner. Last year, Vic emceed at the Women's March, an event that she described as one of her proudest moments. She is also an Amnesty International ambassador for their Women Breaking Barriers campaign and volunteers at a weekly refugee project working with children from asylum-seeking families. Thank you very much. So, Vic, yeah. um, to begin with, um, your mother was a refugee from yeah. the Biafra War. Um, and she came over to the UK and eventually grew up and married your father, who was yes. a Geordie. Uh, yeah. He is. So what was that like growing up in Newcastle in the 80s and 90s? Um, it it was great. I love Newcastle. I don't have a Geordie accent. I'm sad about that. No, you know? I, th I, yeah. It's, it's a real shame because I think it's a great accent. Um, why and well, Why, why <laughs> I? Why I? Mean. But the thing is, I think, cause my, because my mum came over when she was about 11, um, from Nigeria, she didn't speak any English, and she, she was so keen to. I guess, I guess the word, and we don't really use it so much anymore, is assimilate. She wanted to, you know, be accepted, and she learnt English by watching like the BBC, by watching like the news. So she speaks like the Queen. Oh. Um, it's really funny because often she'll say things she doesn't fully understand them, but she says it. She knows it's like the proper thing to say. Um, so she kind of taught me and my brothers to speak like that as well. The war had just finished, so she okay. grew up during the war and came over as, a, as an immigrant. Um, and she told me a lot of stories about how it was when she arrived. When they first arrived, they got, the, the, they were there um, in a little like one bed flat in Newcastle. I don't know why Newcastle at the time, actually. I really feel like they maybe thought it was London. I'm not <laughs> sure. But uh, on the street that they moved into, there was a petition that went round um, to get the darkies out. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Newcastle then, was very different from what I experienced growing up. Thankfully, you know, thankfully things have moved forwards. But for that, my mum has been very protective and she, she, she's brilliant, she's a very strong, very strong woman. Um, and she met my dad because he went to a school next to her and her best friend at school was 
going out with his best friend at school. They were two years apart, 16 and 18, and they've been together ever since. Oh, wow. I know it's a long time, isn't it? It's amazing. Um, They say that they first kissed on the big wheel at the Hoppings, which is this, like, fairground that comes to Newcastle each year. Um, I don't know if I believe them, and maybe it was something more dirty that they're not telling me, but (laughs) I don't want to know. I will take that. But they have an anniversary every time (laughs) each year it comes round. They love the Hoppings. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, yeah, so I grew up in, in Newcastle in a place called Heaton, um, I went to school there. I got a scholarship to go to a pretty good school. So me and one of my brothers got a scholarship there. My other two brothers unfortunately didn't, so they went to a more local one. And I also, I don't know, I was quite a, quite a, I don't know, like do good kid. Bit of a probably a bit precocious and annoying to be honest. I did extra classes. I went to the local comp, the um, adult education classes there to learn Spanish because I really wanted. To, to do languages I got I was one of these kids that gets an idea in their head and I was like I've got to do that I've, I really really want to learn this language my school didn't teach it um so I taught myself how old were you when you did that? uh 16 and so yeah I, I didn't do a GCSE in it or anything but I taught myself so I could do an A level and um got my A level so I could go to Cambridge because I was absolutely adamant because my teacher I, so where I'm from there wasn't that many people going to places like Cambridge I heard about it and I was like I've got to go there because everyone seems to think that you can't get in and it felt like a challenge so I knew I needed an A-level in Spanish if I wanted to do languages which seemed to me like a nice idea um so I made made it my mission to go there and I, I've had a lot of teachers go and you don't want to waste one of your options on that. You're not going to get in. Don't be silly. Um, you'll be disappointed. They were doing it to protect, try and protect me. And to mm. be fair, even my mum and dad were like, it's not it's not something that was ever a part of their world either. In in some ways, they kind of didn't even like the idea of it because they thought it would this, be this really, really like elite place that I wouldn't fit in and I'd be sad. And they were sort of even discouraged a little bit. Um, and, and was it? What was it like when you... And you obviously got there, yeah, which is amazing, and read yeah. modern languages. I did languages in French, Spanish, and a bit Portuguese. Wow, so um, <laughs> I can speak pigeon uh-huh. French, so I'm <laughs> quite proud of that. But. Did, did of, you not get your words mixed up in different classes? Um, a little bit, but I think <laughs> the thing is, they kind of complement each other quite well because they're quite similar languages. So if mm. anything, it helped me to understand. And I knew I needed something as well to set me apart from these people going to Eton and stuff. So I decided to do further maths A level um, again my school didn't do it so I had to like teach myself <laughs> which, wow. which is quite a lot of the time I don't know I look back and think wow I wish I still had that motivation that I had when I was 17 I was That's well amazing. on it mm-hmm. um, but and yeah. what was it like when you got to Cambridge? So Cambridge, Cambridge is presumably was there anyone from your school going or did you know uh, anyone? There was a couple of other people there was it was it was what I sort of expected yeah um Growing up in Newcastle, there was like, Newcastle's a great place, but when I was growing up, there wasn't a huge amount of diversity there, so it wasn't like I, I wasn't used to not seeing other people who looked like me. Cambridge was next level of this. Right. Um, it, it, there's a lot of people who are from very privileged backgrounds. Um, because the schools that they go to, they train them up. So I remember talking once to a director of studies and saying, I wish there was more, you know, you need more diversity here. We need to be working on getting more people from d- different um, backgrounds, whether it's because of their their class or their race, for whatever reason, it this is this is very one sided right now. Um, and he went, I know, but we can't deny the, the people get in on how good they are, how how intelligent they are, how academic they are. We can't deny that if you're coming in from Eton, we can't fault you on your knowledge because you've been well trained in how to pass these exams and how to conduct yourself well in these interviews, and you're confident in a way that a lot of us are not necessarily bred to be. Like I'm not, I wasn't really bred to think that I could talk on a level with someone who is a professor and the best in in the world in their discipline. I'd feel intimidated, but a lot of these kids weren't intimidated by that. And that is a huge thing at that age. And it's a huge thing that differentiates people who, who haven't and who aren't necessarily going to go down that path. So I was intimidated when I first got there. But clearly you had something within you that was just naturally, you were a naturally confident person. And for, for a 16-year-old to basically get the head down, go to night school and get yourself into Cambridge. Mm. That's pretty impressive. Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess I think I didn't think of it like that because, I, I, as I say, I think I really saw it as a challenge because because people had told me that it wouldn't happen. You couldn't do it. I think I okay. really think that's it. I think if, if people hadn't said that, I don't think I would have tried. Mm. Um, and that's always been something that's motivated me throughout life is when it seems like there's a block, there's an obstacle, there's something that says no. 
I, I, I really, really want it to be a yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I feel like I found my tribe a little bit, Cambridge, because although there were all these people who had a completely different background, there were these amazing people I met who had worked as hard, if not harder than me. So when they got to Cambridge, they didn't struggle. They they were used to grafting that hard and, and it is a rigorously academic environment. And so to be able to thrive, you have to put the work in. Mm-hmm. And they knew how to do that. They absolutely knew how. And I had this great group from, of, of friends from all over the world, from all different backgrounds, all different cultures, all different types of schools. Yeah, you do feel a little bit intimidated by, I guess, the type of people who are there. But I, it's all something I, I was used to. As I say, when I was growing up in Newcastle, I was the only girl in my school who was... There was some, there was some I, I would say, like, Chinese, Indian and Pakistani kids, but there was no black kids and no mixed-race kids. There was no one who looked like me, so I was very used to this mm. feeling, like, quite different from everyone else. Or, and I felt that throughout uni. I was always like, do you know, am I supposed to be here? Do you think, do you think that helped you? Helped you become the person that you are. Yeah, I think it. I think as it's been the source of the majority of the discomfort, existential crises, like or, or, or a lot of pain. But it's also been, as you say, something that's helped. I think it's it's kind of helped me mould a sense of identity. Mm. But also understanding that being different is not a bad thing. I think when you're young, all you want is to fit in, isn't it? All you want is to look like everyone else. For me, my biggest insecurity was my hair. I had this frizzy hair, and I remember the, the little girls at school once, I mean, they're so clearly once being told, we're playing a game, and they went, you can't play because no one with frizzy hair is allowed to play. And and can I just butt in here and say, if anyone hasn't seen Vicko's <laughs> hair, Google her hair. It's but amazing. I love I, it. I used to straighten it right up until last, no, 2017. August 2017 was the the time that I finally stopped straightening my hair because my whole life I was so worried about being different. Those little girls, they really changed something inside of me Mm. where I was so, I lacked confidence with it. I hated, I hated my hair so much. I remember asking my mum if I could straighten it. I remember asking her when I was in the bath if she could rub the brown off because I wanted to look the same as everyone else. And I wasn't allowed to play that game that one day and instead I ran off and played on my own and protect you can remember it was Power Rangers. They used to talk into their watch to <laughs> oh, yeah. sword on. I remember just talking into my watch because no one else wanted to talk to me because of my hair. And it really affected me. Oh. And as soon as I was late, allowed to, I straightened it and straightened it and straightened it to look the same as everyone else and to feel confident. And now I love having it like yeah. this. I can't be bothered to be straightened every morning. <laughs> and it makes you yeah. I would have spoken to you on the Power Rangers. <laughs> um, yeah. But clearly that has been a big mat- motivator for you and your work ethic yeah. has just driven you. Yeah. And I think just moving to you now, Sean, you are someone who, you know, you've worked so hard and you're a really successful property developer now. But I, I'm really interested in, you know, what was the house like that you grew up in? So um, I grew up in a three bedroom house. Uh, the ex council houses up in Wrexham, in North Wales. Uh, my parents uh, purchased it from the council when I was four years old, and um, yeah, I lived there with my younger sister, Carly. Uh, she's a year and a half younger than me, and my older brother, Nick, who uh, who also joined the army before I did. You know, the house was the house was fine. You know, we 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 par- my parents did. Um, they tried to give us everything that we could when we were younger. You know, Christmas, they'd spoil us, they'd give us everything we wanted at Christmas, but you, you, you knew that they didn't have much money for the rest of the year. So I remember growing up, I, I, I always said to myself, uh, you know, I can't wait for a job. I can't wait to m- make my own money because I always remember money being a, uh, being a problem for my parents. Okay. Yeah. And you, and as you said, your brother joined the army. Yeah. And is that something that you always wanted to do? Did you, you know, always say, I'm going to join the military? Well, he's six years older than me, and I remember my parents uh, sent him to army cadets because he was playing up, so he didn't actually want to go. But he, they sent him there to, to, to learn some discipline, and uh, I remember uh, being disheartened because I was too young to join the cadets, and yet my brother was being sent uh, without, you know, without him wanting to go. And I think that was the moment that I realised that I wanted to join the army, and uh, watching him uh, join um, you know, just really, um, you know, really built that up in me. Now, in in your story that you tell, which if anyone wants to listen um, to that, it's on a, a mini-sode um, that's available with this podcast, um, you talk about your brother getting injured. Mm. 
Um, you know, I've got two sisters, and I can imagine if I'd heard that one of them had got injured, I don't know about, you've got three brothers. Oh, it, it would shatter me. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. and I, I don't think I would have been able to then go and join the army, but you, but you did. Um, yeah, it was it, it, it's something that I'd forgotten about for such a long time. And then um, uh, my my mum said to me, oh, "Do you remember when remember when Nick uh, was had his incident in uh, in Iraq?" Because I was quite young at the time. Um, I didn't think it was that significant. Obviously, to my brother and my mum, it was. Um, I, I remember uh, sitting down and reading a book that somebody had written about the same incident. And um, it was quite a that your brother got injured. That, that he was there. Okay. It was quite a horrific incident. A car bomb had gone off in the police station, uh, killing a number of uh, Royal Military Police out in Basra. And um, it, he was on a quick reaction force, so he was basically guarding the camp at the time. And because he was the first one on the scene, he you know he witnessed the carnage. Um, the building that he was in, the the windows actually imploded, and that's uh, he suffered a lot of frag wounds from the glass. His, his ears perforated. And uh, I remember my mum telling me that he, she, she had a phone call from one of his officers, basically explaining what had happened, and that uh, Nick's in a bit of shock, but he's all right, he's going to be all right. And, and she remembers speaking to him, and he wasn't making sense; it was just gibberish. Mm. And um, that's you know that's what I remember of my brother's tour in Iraq. Okay. Did he continue serving after that? He uh, he did four years. Um, he, funny enough, he actually was medically discharged. Um, he, he he had a car crash and he broke his arm in five places and because he couldn't no longer do the job he then was medically discharged uh, but it's quite a strange thing um, my great granddad served with the royal west fusiliers in the first world war and he was actually uh fragged by a mem by a mills bomb he suffered um bad knees for it um for years afterwards so uh 1989 was the tricentenary of the regiment it'd been around for 300 years and my great granddad was the oldest uh, member of the regiment at that time and because he was the oldest he was introduced to the Queen now um, after I was injured um, the Queen also gave me my campaign medal uh, after I spent three months in hospital and there was a picture of me sat in a wheelchair um, with the Queen bending down giving me my medal and my granddad pulls out this picture of his dad that was you mm. know the tw 20, 20 years before of the same picture what a lovely uh, story yeah it's yeah, quite a strange yeah. quite an eerie story yeah so if you hadn't joined the army, what would you have done? Um, funny thing is, I, uh, I, I applied to be a bricklayer when okay. I was in school. Uh, I, everyone around me was all, uh, you know, I didn't do well in school. Um, you know, I, I, I couldn't wait to get away from school, to be honest with you. And uh, it was, you left when you were 15. Yeah, yeah. So like, um, you know, I was done with school. And, um, you know, I, I, I had an inkling that I wanted to join the army because of my brother and my granddad. and and the rest of the family, uh, but every, all my friends around me were going off and getting trades. Okay. You know, like bricklayers, yeah. carpenters, electricians. I thought, well, you know, maybe I, maybe that's something I need to do. And uh, I walked into the college and I sat down and, you know, they, they, they asked me, they said, oh, did you like school? And I said, no, I bloody hated school. <laughs> so it, I was honest. I thought maybe if I'm honest, they might give me a job. And uh, they turned around and they said, uh, you know, we, we think the building trade can function perfectly well without you. Okay. Um, so it was good the army said It's quite yes. strange and, and now I'm actually in the building trade and I'm employing people Yay. to do the work for me. So well, it's all right, you yeah. showed them. <laughs> and Vic, what about you? What if you hadn't taken the path that, uh, that you'd taken, what would you be doing? Academia? I, no, oh. Oh, no, God no. I, I really, really wanted to join MI5, MI6. Ah. I mean, I, I'm not saying that was ever a viable option, but that was why I did, when I first decided to do languages, it was because I, I imagine myself doing pretty much what I'm doing now, but telling slightly more serious stories than like Justin Bieber and his new music. Um, but yeah, I thought I'd be in like Warzone's hard hat, bulletproof vest, okay. reporting from the front line. Um, and then when I, when I started uni, I kind of decided I really wanted to get that tap on the shoulder that you get at Oxford and Cambridge. Okay. Be like, so you're kind of like walking yeah, around just showing the secret walk. service but i'm such a flappy head as in i cannot keep a secret i would be a terrible secret agent and mm. um, so this is probably for the best that yeah. i just do a lot of gossip for a living well you've done okay for yourself, <laughs> so um but i mean you both are young you're in your late 20s and you've achieved in your chosen past you know amazing things it sounds as if and i will ask you this um that you had some maybe quite big 
uh, experiences that happened to you when you were at the age of 19. So Vic, mm -hmm. you went off to the other side of the world, to Argentina. Yeah. It's quite a long way from Newcastle. <laughs> yeah. Um, but tell us about that and tell, tell us what happened there. So I, uh, well, if you do languages at any university in the UK, you have to take a third year uh, abroad to get fluent in your chosen language. So mine was Spanish. Um, so you, I mean, it's very rare in life someone's going to say, here's a year, do what you want, as long as it's fairly productive. And a lot of my friends were going to Spain and, and you know, going to uni or whatever. And I was like, no, you know what? This is not going to happen again. I'm going to go to Argentina. I've always wanted to go. Um, I want to be a journalist. I'm trying to make this work. So I managed to get myself an internship at a paper called The Argentina Independent. Um, I was the youngest journalist. And in my within my first week... I was <laughs> I was covering um, erotic art in Buenos Aires. Okay. <laughs> I was my, my first assignment was to like cover the erotic scene. <laughs> my mum was like, "What are you doing out there? <laughs> Going to all these like they're called sex bows right. um, and all it like all this stuff." But it was amazing. I covered the bloodiest year in Mexico's cartel war, which was insane at the time. Um, a lot of Argentine politics, which because democracy was fairly young in that country. It, it it was tumultuous, you know, like learning about what had happened really not that long before um, in Argentina was, was crazy, the dictatorships they'd, they'd been through. And, but I wasn't as conscious as I should have been of, of or as politically engaged as I should have been. And this country really brought that out of me because politics was everything, because it affected every part of their lives on a daily basis, you, right from the protests happening and um, Plaza Mayor and Plaza de Mayo, uh, you know, every week, the mothers who've lost their kids, whose kids have disappeared. They've been taken away and no one knows where they've gone. And it, it really affected me being out there. Um, I worked hard, I wrote a lot of articles. I managed to get the internship turned into um, a job. So I was writing this paper and I started working for MTV while I was there as well, because I met some producers who were like, we need a presenter who speaks English. I was like, I speak great English, guys. It was a, a bit of a weird year, it was, it was really, busy. I, I learned a lot. I really made inroads in my career, but it was all, I, I feel like I hear this quite a lot, but it, as much as it was a great year for my career, it was actually probably the worst year of my life in terms of, I haven't really talked about this. So I, um, so my first boyfriend died that year because we had like, we had been together just before I went to uni. We broke up, we stayed friends though. And then I found out while I was away that he had, um, passed away and my granddad died my grandma died and it all happened while I was away so I felt like I was I felt like I really I think part of the reason that I worked so hard was that I was kind of blocking out the fact that a lot of stuff was happening that I, I had no control over and I was like well I have control over this thing okay I can work really really hard and make something of myself because not everyone gets that opportunity um and not really thought about that but yeah I think part of the reason that I worked that hard that year was because of all that stuff was going mm. on um, and then I came back and it was it was sad. Was it kind of a wait I mean obviously it was clearly a horrible time uh, but yeah was it a, a waking up moment I think you know, so that life is short and yeah and that's something that I, I, I honestly I, if I'm honest with you I don't think I thought about it at the time I, I remember okay. I, I've never talked about about my, my ex-boyfriend's death because I think I completely blocked that out. It was, I, I didn't even grieve it really until I got back and his funeral was, I, I came back, his funeral was like, when I went back to Newcastle, it was in the summer before I went back to uni. And I remember taking a shift at the pub that we'd both worked at together that night. So I'd gone to the funeral, then they'd had the wake at the pub. And I was like, I'm gonna take the shift. I'm gonna be fine. I'm gonna take the shift. I'm not even crying, I'm cool. And I remember, doing my shift and some of the locals were in and they were like bantering and I remember all of a sudden thinking this banter is is not good I don't like the fact that they're bantering it's really this is really insensitive I hate it and I just went to the back and like burst into tears and had to go home and then again the next day I was like no it's fine I don't know why I cried and I didn't think about it again I did literally didn't think about that for probably another two years just completely blocked it out. Um, so and it was, what happened after two years that made you think about it? I I it was in my final year of uni and I was really struggling just with the fact that I did it. Well, as I said before, I didn't want to be there in my final year yeah. at all. I really didn't want to be there. I um, didn't feel like work, doing all this academic stuff was for me. I, I, so much was changing and 
I started seeing a counsellor because I was like, I got to a point where I was really struggling with everything um, and I was crying a lot. You know, you just you just don't know what's going on in your head. You're just totally and overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed by everything. And that was the first time I talked to someone and we unpicked a few things and this came out and she was like, oh, you didn't mention that you had a boyfriend who had died and, you know, your boyfriend from when you were 17 and that's kind of a big deal. And I was like, oh, really? I guess, and I don't know why I'd never thought of it as a big deal, but I guess a part of it, was that I just put it to the back of my mind and that was the first time I talked about it. Um, and did, and by talking about it, did you find that helpful? Yeah, yeah. I think talking about stuff is always helpful mm. and it's a thing that we're often disinclined to do. Uh, and I, I think, I don't know whether it's, is it a social thing or whether it's a Western thing, like we've got the stiff of a lift in, in this country and... Um, yeah, but talking always makes things better. And it's something that I've, especially this year, which has been a very busy year um, for work. And again, it's been a great year for career, but I've started to feel quite overwhelmed. I've realised that talking to your friends and your family and, and not blocking them out of your life and thinking that you can get through things on your own is the best way to have the best possible mental attitude towards things, psychologically be as healthy as possible, Um and yeah, it sounds so cliched, but a problem shared is a problem halved. And it's so true, isn't it? Yeah. And I think, as you say, it's so easy to, when someone else is going through a problem, oh, why don't you talk about it? But when it's actually you, that's a really massive I thing. I hate, you know? yeah, I, I hate being the one to come to my friends and say, is it all right if we just chat through this thing? I'm, I'm very, very unlikely to do that. I'm happy to hear what they have to say. And I, I, I would love to be there for my friends and if they've got problems. But I don't know about you, but I find it really hard to bring my problems to other people. I feel like I'm burdening them. Mm. Yeah, especially being a man, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's not something that men do very often. You know, it's you, you, you meet up with your friends, you take the piss, and you, you crack on. Like, you know, that's, that's one thing. Um, there's a, a TV programme that I took part in called Without Limits this year. We spoke about what we went through in very, very deeply. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that it was it was actually really hard for... For, for the men to actually talk to each other about it because that's something that you don't do and uh, and like learning to tell my story actually really helped me deal with what I went through yeah um uh, you know actually being able to stand up and talk about what you've been through means that you 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 kind of on the other side of it and it doesn't bother you so much anymore when you were serving would you and the other guys talk through your problems ever um not really no while it's kind feeling? of uh, while you're serving it's it's you know it's something that's not acknowledged very often Mm -hmm. um, a lot of guys uh, later on down the line, once they've had time to think about it and overcome what they've been through, uh, what, usually when they've left the military, you know, years down the line, um, that a lot of people don't actually realise they're they're suffering with something because yeah. they've they've been they've been experiencing these sort of feelings for so long that it's so normal to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. If it becomes like normalised, how yeah. can you even? recognize it yeah. you just think that's how you should feel yeah yeah i mean look at you know you didn't talk about your boyfriend dying for two years yeah. and um i know some of the veterans that we've worked with in the past they haven't told what about their injury and what happened to them for sort of 20 or 30 years and and when they do i know it's incredibly hard for them to do that but when they do it's just they find it incredibly therapeutic and that's what's so amazing sean when you tell your story you're so honest and 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 about your emotions and your feelings and the fact that you cried and you got in a dark place and i think that's for anyone listening that's it's so great to hear not that you obviously were in a dark place but that you're just being honest because we all have you know shit days don't yeah. we and yeah. um but you know take us back to when you were 19 mm. and it was i think i've got the date right the 11th of april yes. yeah. and where are you so it's the 11th of april 2010 and i'm in a place called babaji and i'm six days before the end of my tour and we were tasked to go on a on a routine foot patrol that day to to do a resupply for a local um for another regiment that was in the, in the area we were we didn't know if we were actually going to go out that day there was a sandstorm we were on patrol minimize and you know, we're not meant to go out when there's a sandstorm so we're just waiting for it to clear to get the go ahead to go out on this patrol and we all thought it was going to get cancelled and then it must have been about two o'clock in the afternoon uh, where we where we were told to get our gear on and get our weapons uh, we're going out and i'm 
the lead man in in the in the section as I usually was with the Valen, and I must have been about a hundred meters away from where we were based at the time, and I could see what was you know it's a normal sight out in Afghanistan. There was a poppy stack on the side of the road. Now these poppies are you know the big six foot tall poppies that the Taliban use for the opium trade. And last year's harvest, they just leave them piled up on the side of the road like you would see in a, in a field full of cows, you know, with a hay bale. And we'd found uh, 20 uh, improvised explosive devices hidden inside these poppy stacks on the side of these fields. And um, it was part of my job because I had the valve and the metal detector to go and check these out. And I could see uh, a rocket-propelled grenade tail the, the 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 back end of a rocket poking out of the side of one of these poppy stacks and i knew that there was ammunition or something that was hidden inside it so i tell um you know my section to take a knee and i'm going out to check this area out and so you'd gone and checked it out but what happened to you next well i'd, I'd realized it was just the tail of the rpg Okay. And uh, as I bagged it up for forensics, they check it for fingerprints for any uh, known Taliban in the area. Uh, as I f as I gave it to my section commander, who was about five meters away from me at the time, I told him I was going back in because I hadn't searched the area properly. As I turned around and searched it, I, uh, I stepped on an IED uh, on my left leg, and so an improvised explosive yeah, device. Yeah. So um, the the. It was basically like a homemade bomb that the Taliban make out of plastic bottles, explosives, uh, carbon rods out of batteries and wires. And, and um, they plant them in doorways and, and in, uh, vulnerable, in weak spots in, in, between, uh, in between walls. And, and um, yeah, so this, I, this, it was a pressure plate. So basically you stand, when you stand on it, it completes an electrical circuit. And when the electrical circuit meets the explosives it, it, it you know it detonates and and that's when i lost my legs straight away they were blown off completely wow and then and what happened to your sight so um at the time i thought that there was just dirt in my eyes okay so you couldn't see no or, okay no. it was it was straight i couldn't actually see that i'd lost my legs uh I was, you, you couldn't feel it either um, I, th I think because of the shock that I went through, yeah. I think you, the brain's such a marvelous thing that it it shut off the pain but below the bottom, of, you know, below my hips. Right. And um, you know. So what's going through your mind? So I'm just hoping that uh, there's just dirt in my eyes. Okay. I'm hoping that it's it's a mortar that's gone off next to me or or a, an IED, a bomb that's detonated close to me. Uh, you, you know, you, you do hope that once the, everything has calmed down and all the dust has settled, that you know you you're going to be all right. You've got a bit of a flesh wound, especially when you don't feel the pain of your legs being ripped off. It's um, it's quite a strange thing. I imagine if you experienced that sort of pain on the on you know at at the level it was, I don't I don't think you'd be able to survive it. And that's a, it's an amazing survival mechanism of the brain to just shut it off. Now I dislocated my left shoulder at the time. And that that was excruciating. You know, it took it took a couple of years for me to rehab it and fix it up. Yeah, yeah, it was really really painful that one. So after you were injured, you were transported back to Birmingham to Selly Oak Hospital, and put into a medically induced coma. How long were you in that for, and what was it like when you came out of that? Well, it's it's quite strange. Again, I remember Vic saying about uh, her mum. She she had a, a vague, um, you know, uh, a vague image of what she, she you know what went on in the war when mm. she was younger and i imagine for my family at the time it was just they did they, they didn't know their the wrist from their elbow and you know that there i was 19 in the hospital they didn't know if i was going to live or die so i don't know how long i was actually in that coma for my mum says it was weeks months you know it's like it, it, everybody says something different because they were all suffering through shock of what had happened and everybody's experiences were different um, I just remember um, it was strange. I didn't know that I would had left Afghanistan. One minute I'm I'm there doing my job, you know. The next I'm um, I'm in a hospital in Birmingham. Like I I I didn't I hadn't even come to terms with what happened to me on the day. I didn't know I'd really lost my legs. I didn't know what had happened. It's just like within a blink of an eye, you your whole world's changed, and you wake up in a hospital with a bandage around your head and both your eyes, you know, and and your legs missing and. 
and telling you that you you know you'd lost everything is at 19 is uh, is quite a, a tough place to be. That's been really scary. Yeah, it was. It was. A, you know, I I couldn't see a thing. Um, my left hand, um, I think, I had ten operations on my left hand and shoulder to try and get it fixed and working. So I had one arm that worked. Um, they gave me a one-handed wheelchair that I couldn't push myself oh, for a gosh. couple of years because I couldn't see enough to even push my wheelchair. Um, I, I, the strange thing was I didn't even I don't even know what Celio Hospital looked like. When and how I, long were you in there for? I was there for three months. You've um, got no recollection. No, no. I just remember voices, names, uh, and and you know just like I think we drove past uh, a couple of years ago, and I, I you know I can see a bit now, and mm. I, I didn't recognise anything. You know, it's it's quite strange. Are you scared? Yeah, yeah, very scared. Yeah. Um, being nineteen at the army, I was a, I was a professional soldier. I had a, a real great future in the army. You know, um, and it was your dream. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, at that age, being a teenager, you know, women uh, is quite a high uh, priority. And uh, you're realizing that you've lost your legs, and now you're in a wheelchair. You're, you're you're blind. You're disabled. You've lost your independence, and your parents have got to do everything for you. It's it's a horrible place to be. Mm. Yeah. So how do you move forward from that? Um, I suppose it's time and. T taking it one step at a time like in them days um it was a triumph that i'd managed to brush my own teeth that i'd dress myself that i'd been to the toilet on my own and it was like that for for months you know i i didn't look at a i couldn't see a computer screen or a phone for at least two years you know i'd lost all i'd lost i couldn't even walk out the house you know i, I, I didn't have a car um you know i couldn't use the internet social media you know, um, I didn't know who I was talking to half of the time. It was it was tough. It was extremely tough. But I suppose you you put a brave face on it. I think I was embarrassed about my eyesight injury at first because of what it took away from me. It took my independence, and you know I I was very independent from a young age. I joined the army at sixteen. Um, you know I did everything for myself, and now I'd lost it all, and I felt like a baby. I felt like a child. And now I was living in a bed in the downstairs living room. I, I couldn't even go to the toilet on the own, it was tough. Your mum, how was she? You know, they they actually suffered a lot. Yeah. You know, because I, I knew I could kind of do something about it. It was up to me if I if I was gonna try and turn this around. You know, I'm, they're helpless. They can't really yeah. do anything. They're just trying to make it better. You know, they didn't, they didn't know what the future was gonna hold. You know, the, the 19 year old son, blind and lost his legs and now like yeah I, I was I was practically like a child again yeah. was there a moment because when we've spoken to other people and we've called it the light bulb moment where um people have said that there is this literal moment where they just get real clarity on how they're going to move forward mm. with their life was there firstly to you sean was there was there this light bulb moment or is that kind of a, a I th dream i think that... i think that's a bit of a dream i think it's many hundreds if not thousands of light bulb moments because once you've had a light bulb moment it only takes you know a, a, a setback to be back in the same place and especially in them early days an operation or you know something not working was very easy to put me back into a dark place um, but i suppose as time went on uh, and you pull yourself up out of it many, many times, you, you become more resilient. You know, next time you know that you, you, it's, it's time to go for it again. You know, you know what you went, how you went wrong the last time and you pick it up and go again. And, and I, I imagine the rest of my life is going to be like that. So that's one thing I have learned is that it's not going to be plain tailing. Everybody goes through you know, tra some sort of traumatic experience in their lives. It's just, you know, how, how it defines us, what we can learn about it and how we can better ourselves from it. And yeah. yeah, I was going to say, it was, everyone is always going through something. I think it's something that you learn throughout life every day. And the more we talk about stuff, the more we realise that, you know, it, that we're all in it together and we can support one another. And I think that's often the series of light bulb moments is actually not from within you, but from the people that you meet along the way, the people that help you, the people you talk to, the people whose problems you you hear. And every time you hear from another person, I guess you realise that, yeah, that you, that you can work through it because they can. You're inspired by people 
you hopefully inspire other people mm. you, you definitely do sean yeah, and as you go through life doing that and learning that they're like mini mini moments yeah. Mini light bulbs. Yeah, yeah, mini little fairy lights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah LEDs. LEDs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll yeah. rebrand it. We'll rebrand it. But you said that you you found counselling really useful. I did, uh, yeah. What what instigated that? Why did you feel like, oh, I need to go and talk to someone? Because I'd been stewing for so long on okay. my own. This yeah I think my if if there's gonna be a light bulb moment, it'd probably have come the the last year that just went. Um and I started talking to someone more and more frequently um, and making making it a priority as opposed to a thing that just did if I could because y you need that you need to look after your mental health and I think for a long time I'd thought that it was a secondary um, priority and I and and I just worked and worked and worked and um, I had a, a big breakup last year followed by a house move I went from moving with uh, living with my friends to living alone and a lot of work stuff and it's you, when you have various changes in your life, you either deal with them or you sweep it under the carpet. I just kept sweeping things under the carpet and just like getting on with it. And then I realized I was quite quite alone actually, like living on my own and not having a boyfriend anymore, which is great. And you should be able to be independent, but equally you should be able to talk to someone. I've been, I've been working for a little bit and coming up against quite a lot of obstacles in uh, this industry, radio and TV. As much as I work really, really hard, it's still, a difficult industry especially for women especially if you're not from London you don't you know you don't have financial input from parents or there's lots of ways that you can be locked out of this industry and you can feel that you're not welcome and um, there have been lots of incidents that I'd come across of sexism in the workplace and stuff just being a bit shit and me feeling like it wasn't fair and I was like no matter how hard I work I can never be as good as that guy because there's not really a place for me and I I realised last year that instead of dwelling on that, um, that I could make it better for the next generation of girls. So I started doing a lot more work with Amnesty. Uh, I wrote an article for Marie Claire about sort of raising points that maybe had been not spoken as much before. Um, I'm working on campaigns to help women break boundaries in their workplaces um, and getting more women talking about issues so they realised that that if we're a critical mass of women speaking out about stuff that's going on that's not acceptable, that our companies are gonna to have to change, they're gonna to have to make some changes. Um, and all of a sudden I went from like being really down about the fact that this is a difficult industry to really excited about how we can change the industry. Um, and I just think that rather than your own career path, as soon as you start making it about the next generation's mm. career path, it becomes, it becomes a much, more enriching endeavor and you're still doing well you're doing what you need to do you're telling the stories you want to tell but you're making it so that more people can tell more stories and that's the point of broadcasting is that we is that we have diversity of voices so paving the way for there to be more diverse voices has become a bit of a mission now absolutely what an amazing legacy to be leaving as well uh, and doing good and you, you know you mentioned there about prisoners as well that sean you um uh, as we mentioned in um, the biography, you were recognised in the New Year's Honours list for your work with charities. And um, I don't think there's many people I know who've had a prison wing <laughs> named after yeah. them. Tell us about the work that you do there. So uh, the HMP Berwyn is a, is a new state-of-the-art prison that's just been built in Wrexham. So it's the, 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 the first prison that's been built in the last 30 years. And it's the biggest uh, prison in, in the whole of Europe. Uh, I'm from Wrexham, so I'm from the local town where it's built. And I was sitting on a train, actually, funny enough, coming down to London to give a talk for uh, the Drive Project when I mm -hmm. sat next to uh, one of the um, governors of the prison. Now, I walk around in shorts, so it's pretty easy to see that, you know, I've lost my legs. And uh, she has two sons in, uh, in the army band. So usually when people have uh, family members in, in the military they come and say hello and talk about their family members and and uh, I asked her what does she do and she said I, well I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a governor in the local prison in the new prison and at this point it, it, it was half built so none of the wings had names you know there was no men in the prison system and uh, I basically said to her I've been wanting to get in touch 
to offer my services to come in and uh, speak to the men and help them with their rehabilitation. And she said that they, they were opening a wing of uh, uh, just specifically for veterans. And it's a new one of its kind. And they're hoping that it's going to help them rehabilitate uh, rather than being spread around the whole prison system. And uh, I went in, I, I, I started volunteering and giving talks. And then uh, they asked, how would you feel if we decided to call it the Sean Stocker community? Now, at the time, I was thinking, you know, do, do, I, do I want a prison wing named after me at the time? And uh, I, I said to myself, well, if, if, if I'm going to really make a difference here, it's, you know, the legacy that I leave is, is down to the work that I put in. So I, I decided to go, uh, to go along with it. They, they, and, um, you know, I, every time I go in there, the respect that I get from these men, uh, you know, it's, it, you, you do feel like you're doing a really good job there. Because I, I, I thought to myself, well, I want to help veterans. You know, I want to I want to use my story to uh, to raise awareness and help veterans. And I thought, who are the veterans that need the most help? It's obviously veterans in the prison system. So by going in and helping them rehabilitate and stop, re you know, and to help them stop reoffending, uh, you know, I would go in and I would sh get involved with some of the positive work and, and tell them my story of how I managed to turn my life around. You know, I say that their traumatic experience, you know, is, is, is the crime that they have done and now they've had their lives and their families taken away from them. Um, you know, why not use this time in prison because they've got a lot of time on their hands to, 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 you know, to try and make your life better afterwards, which is, and, and then that way they can look back at this time and say, you know, maybe, maybe it was a good thing that I went to prison. And you're sort of passing on how you dealt with your traumatic experience yeah. to them and yeah. turning it into something positive. Yeah. Now, you've both spoken about storytelling and the power of storytelling. Why do you think it's so important to tell your story and, and more widely have a conversation? Oh, for a number of reasons. I mean, you just never know who's going to hear it and who it might help. I think knowing that you're not alone is incredibly important. Um, knowing that... Not that you're normal, because normal's not the right word, but that what you're going through doesn't make you crazy or a freak or the fact that you're struggling. When you tell a story, you you reach out. You also communicate, um, I guess, ways that you've dealt with things that could be helpful to other people. Um, you express yourself, which is important and is often stifled uh, in our society. And I think the more people who tell their stories, the more we will respect one another and realise that we are gloriously different from each other, but also exactly yeah. the same yeah. at the same time. And that's a brilliant thing. And that's so many problems in our world are because we're scared of the fact that we're different. But in being different, we're so similar. Mm. And if we can accept that, I think it's a really powerful step forward. We should be encouraging as many people to tell as many stories as possible. And Sean, how about you? I think um, being able to stand up and tell a story is one of the biggest gifts that I've ever been given. Um, for me, standing up and telling my story for 20 minutes, um, you know, it really changes lives. Um, you know, if it helped one person in the audience going through a really tough time, then, then mm -hmm. my, my 20 minutes is, is you know, I, I'd, I'd, give, I'd give a whole day for that, you know. Yeah. How and, brilliant. And it's, it's um, yeah, so that's, that's it's, it's helped me deal with what I've been through as well. Um, to, to be able to stand up and take people to their, to your lowest points, um, it really shows that you, you, you know, you're over them, you're over that period. And, and I just love the fact that both of you have spoken about your, the legacy and um, that you both are going to be leaving, I believe you are, and you're using your platforms, you know, you're um, raising awareness of women's rights and Sean, you know, you with veteran prisoners and what I think is so exciting that the work that you're doing is almost like that, you know, pebble that hits the water and that, what is the ripple effect? We, what I said earlier about being at school and being told by the other girls I wasn't allowed to play because I looked different from them. If that little girl had heard a story from someone who looked like me, who was like me, who had parents from different cultures or had frizzy hair like me. Just one story could have made that situation not have happened and the pain that it caused not have happened. And hopefully that situation isn't happening now because 
I'm telling my story now. Absolutely. And, and I hope that the little girls are listening. So in the same way that what would you say to your younger self? What would I say? Um, just keep, keep pushing forwards. Yeah. Um, just keep fighting. Keep going. Um, you know, time, time will take, you know, t- time will heal. Um, don't, you know, yeah, just, just, you know, keep going. That's what I'd say. Thank you. Now, how have you found the conversation today and sharing sort of really honestly about your experiences? I've, I've, you know, it's it's really uh, interesting to hear what you've been through. It's a totally different scenario, but yet there's so many um, things in there that are exactly the same as what everybody goes through. Yeah, uh, I, I think because your story is so, I mean, it, it's so powerful and it it feels like a thousand miles away from anything that most people can relate to to be honest but actually there's so much that you've mentioned that i think we can all relate to when it comes to the importance of sharing and talking and and mental health it's been really like i don't know it's been really illuminating so thank you i really appreciate it it's been really really great experience well, from my point of view, and it has been absolutely lovely to um, listen to you both. And thank you so much to both of you for being so honest as well and for sharing. Thanks, thanks for having much. us. Yeah, thank you. It's been great to meet you, Sean. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Me. I don't know, should we shake, do we shake hands? <laughs> shake, shake, shake hands. Shake, shake hands. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, thank you so much.